Alright, hello everyone! Welcome to the Sasuke 28 live pre-show. And just like with Sasuke 25 and Sasuke 27, we're going to have ourselves a little um, pre-show, little live show, where we're going to get our, you know, gather around, talk about the upcoming Sasuke competition, and just have a good time reminiscing and predicting and talking about a whole bunch of other stuff. Um, so one of the things that uh, we... Uh, know about this uh, new Sasuke Rising tournament is that um, this will be the last competition for the Sasuke All Stars. Are there ads? Stars. And um, unfortunately, you know, uh, we won't be seeing them again after this. And it, I think it would be very appropriate if. Um, you know, one of the things that we talked about is talk about um, our past memories with Sasuke, especially um, how uh, we got introduced uh, to the show. And so one of the things that I thought about after the whole uh, announcement about the uh, All-Stars uh, retiring after this competition was um, exactly how I became a fan of the show and more specifically what things in my life that um, specifically influenced um, my taste and how I liked, uh, how I uh, you know came to uh, love this show that we all uh, enjoy very much. So, trying to okay, cool. Um, so thinking back, thinking all the way back, I think one of the earliest shows that. Um, influenced uh, my tastes uh, was a show on Nickelodeon called Double Dare. And Double Dare was a great um, show. Um, it was it was messy. It was... <laughs> Everyone's got ads coming up. Uh, it was messy. It was over top. But it had a lot of you know, it was it was a whole bunch of physical challenges along with uh, trivia, and I'm just going to pause for a minute because apparently everyone's getting an ad now. <sighs> Let me know when you guys are done with the ad because apparently everyone's having them. Yeah. Yes. Uh, click watch now. Just try, just try to our best to sync the ads at the moment. Well, you just got here. That's why you don't have an ad. A bunch of other people do. One second. Okay. Um, like I was saying, uh, one of the shows that influenced influenced me was um, was the show Double Dare. And one of the the best things about Double Dare was at the end, the family that won went on to the uh, Double Dare obstacle course. And so it was a uh, eight-part obstacle course that um, the team had to get through in a minute. And, you know, the it had just a wide variety of obstacles, many of them very silly and messy and stuff like that. But um, that really, like, introduced me, like, a lot of, uh, you know, concepts that, were you know you see in Sasuke even you know it's just it's uh, you know a series of obstacles you know um, c trying to complete um, the course within a set amount of time um, the fact that most people uh, in fact failed the um, obstacle course but um, the way it was presented with with the time and the fact that Mark Summers is an incredibly enthusiastic host who is in uh, very into the show. Um, you got genuinely excited whenever someone won because um, victory was not common. And I think that's one of the things that made uh, Double Dare so great and what you know later influenced me and my tastes. And you saw this in uh, later um, Nickelodeon game shows like uh, Guts and Legends of the Hidden Temple with uh, that had similar ideas. And I think those early shows really uh, influenced me in the fact that I just I love obstacle course game shows, which um, also uh, another 
big obstacle course game show was uh, American Gladiators, um, the uh, the original at the time. Um, original American the original American Gladiators the um, had a whole bunch. It was presented like a sports show, and it had a whole bunch of uh, these games where it was you know average Joes against uh, these. Um, you know these mammoth, muscular, uh, athletic men and women trying to take them down, and I think you know to me that was like one of the first uh, shows where you know the whole idea that anyone can do these extraordinary things. You know it's not going to be easy, but anyone can do it, which is also another common theme that we see in Sasuke these days. The whole idea that you know the average person can do extraordinary things on these courses. And um, in regards to the original one, I think the uh, the Eliminator courses, especially um, around season three, um, really started to get you know very intense to watch. And um, um, you know, I saw I did see the uh, the revamp from a few years ago that um, American Ninja Warrior uh, 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 competitor Evan Dollard had to uh, has had competed in. Um, I, I liked it, but it felt more like it was being, like, a reality show and less a game show, and, you know, there was a few other things that I didn't care about it, but, um, it just didn't capture the same stuff, but, fast forwarding a little bit, uh, another show that I can, um, say perhaps influenced me for liking Sasuke, um, yeah, that was weird. Um, but I guess another one of the shows that kind of influenced my taste and why I like Sasuke so much, um, believe it or not, I actually, I kind of thought about this, but, um, Pokemon, believe it or not. Um, and specifically the TV show, not the, uh, video games or anything else. But, um, in regards to Pokemon, Pokemon was the first show that I, I watched on TV, that was that I knew as I was watching it was a Japanese show. Um, you know, I had watched Power Rangers, which obviously takes a whole bunch of footage from Japan, but you know, you didn't know that it was Japanese. With Pokemon, we knew right away it's a Japanese show. Um, this is something that is from Japan, and I think that's you know, for a lot of people, this was um, a big introduction to something that you knew was decidedly Japanese in various uh, shows and, you know, video games and culture and stuff like that. Um, one of the, the hey, hey, referring to me, my gen, my people my age, um, one of the things, now thinking back, Pokemon actually had a very interesting theme of um, failure. Um, there are many times, especially early on in the show, where Ash fails. Like, you know, he's, he tries to achieve something and, and fails. And sometimes he, you know, fixes, you know, sometimes he, you know, overcomes and wins the next time. But there are times where he decidedly fails. And I think perhaps the biggest instance is where around episode 83 or something like that, he makes it to, you know, the Indigo, um... Plateau tournament, uh, which was supposed to be you know this big grand finale thing where, for the entire series so far, is what the entire show was uh, leading up to. Um, and at the time, me and my friends had basically we you know expected that Ash would win the entire tournament because we felt like that was kind of like you know, like a cliche. It's like, oh, he's the main character. Of course he's going to win. Um, spoiler alert, he doesn't win the tournament. He, in fact, he never won the tournament. He never comes back and tries again. He failed. He lost. He, you know, for, you know, for 80 plus episodes, he tried to be the very best and failed. And at the time, as a kid, that really, like, just that really resonated with me, just the idea that sometimes, um, you know, you're, you're not going to succeed, and I think 
like in that way, I think that like the show, at least early on, was actually pretty good. In that, um, um, you know, as far as like teaching you know kids various lessons. Um, good point because that's the next thing I was gonna bring up. My first introduction to Japanese game shows uh, was um, a show that aired in the U.S. under the name Most Extreme Elimination Challenge. It was a gag dub of a Japanese game show called Tashaki's Castle. And um, in the U.S., I know, in, uh, in various European country countries, it is known as Tashaki's Castle, and it is dubbed completely differently. Um, but in the U.S., it was um, various things were just changed, and you know they had a, a plot that uh, had nothing to do with the show. It was a complete gag dub, and it was fantastic. It was so funny, especially you know at the time. Just the idea of these people doing these like incredibly ludicrous games that just looked absolutely silly. Yes! The Septic Sludge! It's just, like, you have these games that are so uh, crazy, and you're watching it, you're, like, you're half watching it because of the crazy games, but then, when you're watching the show, you realize that the dub itself is so incredibly well written, because they, they took the time to, you know, really think, you know, think, you know, how can we make this funny? And the funny thing is, is that I don't like if they tried playing like the original version but with like regular dubbing I don't think it would have been successful in the US um, just because the way it's the way it's run in you know in the original Japanese version I don't think it would have resonated with American audiences but um, just like the added sound effects and just the various like the many many jokes in MXC it made it was a huge hit on Spike TV, and in you know many can say that outside of you know WWE Raw, which was on Spike at the time, it was you know the biggest show on the network. Um. So yeah, that and then and even then they um, you know they actually had a uh, a single episode where they brought four of the games. Uh, to Universal Studios, and they had a whole bunch of uh, college kids uh, play the games, and it was it was a massive success. It was uh, it was it was a great show to watch. I actually um, I own all the DVDs that they have, um, and so it was just incredibly well done, and I think that is what eventually led me to. Uh, seek out other shows like um, Viking. Viking was the next show that I was influenced uh, by. I uh, When it was airing on uh, ESPN, I um, specifically I have seen on ESPN, I've seen Viking 2 and Viking 3. I don't know if any other Viking has aired on ES ESPN 2, my bad. Um, because I've never seen anything else. So this was, this was, um, the first time being introduced to, essentially the Sasuke format, except it's on Viking, except it's Viking. And, um, you know, at first it was like, it was really weird because it was like this really intense show where, um, you know, if you fall in the water, you're out, you're done. There's no second chances, there's no, like, you know wacky characters it was a very serious show and I immediately fell in love with it I remember I watched it on a Saturday morning they just they played uh, Viking 2 and Viking um, 3 back to back and um, and Viking 2 also gave me my introduction to Makoto Nagano because he was in that tournament and had actually um, made it all the way to the final stage um, what's interesting is that, like, he dominated, um, basically. He, um, he was the only... It's kind of weird because, um, ESPN edited the show a lot. Like, I, I know we complain, we complain about G4's editing, um, bef even before they started, um, 
uh, taking out people. Um, oh, uh, take out, um, except for the last my train of thought there. Uh, I know we complain about G4, but um, ESPN2, you know, they take two, they took two whole stages out. I, or I guess one and a half, you can say. They took out, uh, in between stage one and stage two, they took out this um, part where um, it, it's kind of like the brain, um, the brain memory game from um, Kini Kun Banzuke, um, where basically they were um, uh, uh, grouped into four, uh, in, into groups of four, and they have to try to remember uh, numbers. And um, you know they completely cut that out. And then the other one they cut out was in between, in between uh, Nagano doing the pegboard and trying the final stage. The there was the um, bio clock uh, challenge, which was like, I guess it was technically the final part of the third stage, uh, if my understanding is correct. Um, but basically, it's just a simple um, press a button and then press it again. Um, ten seconds later, and you have to be within plus or minus half a second. And if you were right, you move on to the final stage. And if you're wrong, um, the giant trap door that you're standing on drops you into the water. Um, if I remember it correctly, it's been a while since I've seen that clip. Um, but yeah, ESPN just like flat out cut it out. And it, like not only did they cut it out, they made it look like the heartbreaker, which was originally the um, end of stage two, was actually the beginning of stage three. It was. It's one of those things where it's like when you know the changes they made, it was very weird. But at the time, when I was watching it, like, you know, Nagano was the only person to beat the Heartbreaker. In fact, there was only two people who had even made it to the Heartbreaker. Nagano was the only one person to beat it. And then he, you know, and I was just thinking like, wow, this guy's amazing. And then um, he beat the pegboard and I was just like, wow. And um, the final stage was very exciting to watch and I actually I remember the first time um watching it like he somehow um he it looked like he was so close to, to winning it looked like he was going to beat the final stage but he he ran out of gas at the end of the final rope climb and he lost and it was just so 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 crushing really um, to watch, it just, it, it was my first taste of, you know, just, ha of this, you know, immense intensity with the final stage. It was, um, it was really fun to watch. And then, um, uh, they, if I remember correctly, I don't think ESPN2 even, um, even showed, uh, Nagato's run Viking 3, which... In hindsight, it's kind of weird, but I guess they didn't want to show him failing stage one. Um, there's still some confusion about the way they presented um, uh, stage uh, Viking 3, because there might have been only three stages but uh, instead of four, but it's possible that they just lied and said that the third stage was actually the final stage. Um... I was never quite clear on that one. Uh, yes, Nagano was the only one to beat the ultimate plank. Um, no, actually, um, in in well, he uh, in Viking three, um, one, in Viking three they changed the order of of certain obstacles. Um, if assuming ESPN two is right. Um, they moved the heartbreaker back to the end of stage three instead of the end of stage two and with the new stage three um the uh pegboard did uh appear before the heartbreaker and so one person uh did make it to the pegboard and like fall almost immediately um Um, I believe in the, the new stage three, it was, uh, the first obstacle was the eagle eye, which was like this thing where it's like, find the letter and the spinning wheel of numbers. Then it was the steady voyager. Then it was the, uh, pegboard and then the, um, then the heartbreaker. And I'm blanking out on his name. What's, um, 
Kong Hawkeye, yeah. Um, who's the delivery man, Kongu's name? I am totally blanking out at the moment. I'm having a brain fart. Uh, Ta yes, Ken yes, Takahashi. Um, Kenji, he was in Viking 3, uh, before he shaved his head. And I don't remember if... I believe he made it to, to stage 3 of Viking. I don't remember if he's the one who, made, who failed at the uh, alternate plank, or if he's the one who failed at the steady voyager. Because there was two people who made it that far. And, um... That's that. Those were the final results, um, but yeah, Viking, very interesting, um, very interesting show. Wish it lasted longer than it did. Um, the family and celebrity ver versions were okay for what they were, in my opinion. But um, but then eventually, you know, but the, the, the funny thing is going quickly back to MXC. If MXC didn't exist. We probably would have never had um, Viking and Ninja Warrior on U.S. television because MXC was the show that uh, basically broke new ground for Japanese TV in the U.S. Basically saying, "Hey, you know, this can work." Um, and my door. Hold on. Sorry, that was bothering me. Um, does it? I thought, um, I remember watching MXC before, like, long before Viking. Because, because I remember Viking, because I remember watching MXC when I was in middle school, and watching, um, Viking when I was in high school. 2006? Um... MXC aired much earlier than 2006. Yeah. Yeah, I'm pretty sure MXC came first and is part of the big reason why we've saw we've seen other Japanese shows um, in the U.S. for better or for worse, like. Um, like Viking, Hey Spring of Trivia, um, Hole in the Wall, Wipeout, um, Silent Library. There's, there's an American version of Silent Library. Um, you know, um, and then eventually, um, that takes me to Ninja Warrior. Um, I remember back in, I believe, 2006, uh, fall 2006. Uh, yes, they, there is an American Silent Library. It's uh, basically, it's American college students um, doing those crazy things that you've seen, and if they can complete them without being too loud, they win cash. That's basically how it works. It's pretty, pretty amusing, actually. Um, but uh, basically, fall 2006, I remember watching G4 and they were advertising these new shows for this lineup that they had called Midnight Spank. And one of these shows was this Japanese show called Ninja Warrior. And and at first I didn't watch it because it was on at the same time as Inyasha and that took precedent because it was the final because it was the final episodes. But um I ended up catching Sasuke 15 um, um, in October still, uh, they, they played all the episodes, um, epis of, uh, Sasuke 15 on a Saturday, uh, afternoon. I ended up catching it all in a row, and, and I was immediately hooked. I, I immediately, uh, was just like, wow, this is amazing. Um, and it, it, it was it was just a really cool show. Um, there, you know, it, it's just, it, I mean, it's I love obstacle courses. I I loved I loved the characters they saw. I immediately loved you know the octopus and the the hang 
Glider Man. I'm blanking. Um, I like the I like I like the rolling log. That was one of the things I immediately noticed. Was just like holy cow, this thing is this is crazy. There's this giant there's this giant warp there's this giant curved wall that they have to run up. Holy crap, what is this? That was one of the things I immediately you know thought upon watching the show, and then. I saw. Oh wow! Wait a minute. That's that. That's that Nagano guy from Viking. I remember him now. And, and then we uh, got to the second stage, and he was the um, only one who failed um, the chain. Uh, the um, metal metal spin. Thank you. <laughs> he was the only one who failed the metal spin, and they showed him first, and it was like, wait. But what? He failed there? Huh? It was it was a very weird thought seeing that, but then you see then you see the you know, the third stage and you know, you see Shiratori who at one point had, you know you know, he had heat stroke at one point and make it, you know, that far. It was just the show just blew my mind even more than probably even more than Viking did at the time and so every week um, every Tuesday at midnight I was watching new the newest Ninja Warrior whether it was you know for you know, Sasuke 16 and then eventually Sasuke 17 and I remember uh, when they first showed the final episode of uh, Ninja Warrior 17 um, it was actually, if I remember correctly, it was the day after Christmas they aired it. And watching Nagano beat the final stage, it was just... It was... I was so excited. I was so excited once I s saw um, Nagasaki make it to the final stage. And then I had to wait a whole week, and I was just so excited for that week to end even though christmas was in the way and then uh you know i see nagano beat it and uh and then uh takeda was just you know seeing him fail and oh man it was it was great like i sasuke 17 was really good in my opinion <laughs> um but no, it's just like this whole thing. It's like, oh man, you know, you, someone beat it. Someone beat the show. That is amazing. That is, you know, that that's why I like this show. That's why I like it. It's just watching these, you know, seemingly normal people overcome this, you know, amazing obstacles. It's it's a very good show overall. And I like to think that people agree with me. You know, specifically you people um yeah um <laughs> Sasuke 18 was a huge change from Sasuke 17 <sighs> and then um in 2007 they started airing a lot older uh, tournaments and it's one of those things where like even though I know what's going to happen in, in that everyone loses. It was still a lot of fun to watch. And then um, watching, you know, Konoichi when they started airing that was equally as fun. Um, yeah. And then fast forward to now. We have our 28th Sasuke competition. <clears throat> oh, excuse me. Um... So yeah, so that is my own personal Sasuke journey of how I grew to love this show. Obviously, the show ends, uh, the story ends, <laughs> obviously, um, the story ends with me eventually discovering the Sasuke Maniax form um, after being a part of the G4 Ninja Warrior uh, boards for a while, and being able to... Um, and being able to you know watch the original Japanese version live with people, um, that's a lot of fun. It's a lot. Of, it's a great amount of fun, and um, I, you know, hopefully we'll have y years of more to come, and hopefully American Ninja Warrior will be better. 
<sighs> okay. Um, I, I'm going to uh, temporarily stop this recording, um, start up a new one, and then uh, we will start taking calls. So if you um, if you want to be a part of the show, I am currently writing the Skype name that you should be uh, contacting. Um, send me a message if I am currently not on your uh, friends list, and I'll explain some uh, more rules uh, just a second. <laughs> 